And so I want to urge everybody, starting with the Minister of Agriculture and everyone else, let us support this SRI method with our maximum capacity. And this SRI method is a proven example where the agriculture is sustained and as a correction to the Green Revolution. Discarding the use of chemical fertilizers that damage the environment in the long run. Is seeing is believing. And that's why training is important. Demonstration plots are also important. As we were harvesting a moment ago, Mr. Solin related to me that as this is introduced to the folks, husbands and wives can get rather agitated towards each other. What usually is a clump is now a single seedling. What if it doesn't grow? But after a while, as the days go by, there's conviction that this technology is not fuzzy, but rather brings much gain and increase. Once again, I repeat why we should fully support this SRI method, because it increases production and yet does not damage the environment. That's the key. We should think about the future of our children, the lives of our next generation. Let's not squander our resources and leave them without theirs. New challenges have emerged for agricultural sciences and practice. The world in the 21st century has changed physically and not all for the better. Land available for farming per capita by the year 2050 will be only one-third of what it was a century earlier. Global climate change is adversely affecting the productivity of a large part of the world's farmland, especially in the tropical regions. United Nations statistics show that by 2020, almost 60% of the world's population will be in Asia, where rice is the main staple. There have been attempts to increase rice production through various technologies. However, evidence from the field suggests a phenomenon of reduction in rice production. In the early days of the Green Revolution, up to the early 1980s, the rice production nations of Asia enjoyed annual rice yield increases of 2.5% and production gains of over 3%. However, between the middle of the 1980s and the late 1990s, the rate of annual yield increase was nearly halved and the rate of production increase fell even further. Rice, directly or indirectly, supports hundreds of millions of people. So, improving farmers' ability to grow rice efficiently and in a sustainable way is essential for ensuring food security, alleviating poverty and improving the well-being of rural and urban populations alike. Millions of the world's poorest acquire 60 to 70 percent of their calories from rice and spend up to 40 percent of their income on it. And the graph of global population increase compared to that of rice production is not a pretty picture. But there is hope. Sebenarnya, tanaman padi mempunyai potensi yang besar untuk dikembangkan. Actually, rice plants have incredible potential for development if it's supported by good management of soil, plant, water, and other factors in its ecosystem. Since production increases will have to be accompanied with diminishing availability of water, improvement of plant root systems and building up soil organic matter will be important for making better use of potential soil water storage. Professor Andrew Ball is Chair of Environmental Biotechnology at the School of Biological Sciences at Flinders University 
in South Australia. For many years, he's held a deep interest in ways to help plants develop better root systems associated with their having more effective communities of supportive soil biota, mainly microorganisms. That is important for enabling crops to cope better with climate change and other traumatic extreme events. So the microorganism here you can see growing really efficiently in very good biomass is what we're trying to achieve in the field. It is important that farmers provide the nutrients and provide the conditions with which organisms like this fungus can grow and produce energy and release nutrients back into the soil which the root of the plant will then take up and achieve maximum productivity. But abundance of microorganisms combined with good water and soil management will also affect the emissions of a couple of major greenhouse gases. Microorganisms in soil generally grow with lots of nutrients, lots of air, and lots of water with them. Too much of a good thing is not always good. If the microbe is covered in water, then of course there's no air to get into the soil. Under these conditions, microorganisms can still grow, but they grow less efficiently, they produce less nutrients, and what they do instead is start to produce methane. Methane is less efficient for the microorganism. It doesn't produce as much energy. It doesn't produce as much nutrients, which it then releases to the roots. And therefore, our productivity of a rice will decrease. Importantly, the emission of methane will also result in a greater greenhouse effect. Methane is some 30 times more efficient as a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. We can measure methane uh, production in a variety of ways, very simply, like uh, this system, where we're uh, measuring biogas production from uh, a vessel. So we can take our samples from the field, we can bring them back to the laboratory, and we'd measure the amount of biogas produced, which would give us a, an indication of how much methane is produced. Alternatively, we can actually use uh, an instrument in the field, which when placed over the, uh, an area, fixed area in uh, the paddy field will detect an, an increase in methane concentration. And this is uh, an infrared gas analyzer which will actually uh, tell us the grams of methane produced per uh, unit area of, of soil. So in that way we get a very clear and accurate measurement either using a simple laboratory system or a more sophisticated field system of methane generation. Another important greenhouse gas is nitrous oxide. Nitrous oxides are produced naturally via soils through the addition of fertilizers, mainly chemical uh, inorganic fertilizers, but also organic fertilizers. The more fertilizers you put on, the more nitrous oxide emissions you produce, the more significant nitrous oxide emission factors are to greenhouse warming. It's highly efficient, it's some 300 times more efficient as a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide itself. If a soil requires fertilizers, it tends to be running inefficiently. Anaerobic systems like paddy fields produce a lot of nitrous oxides because we need high productivity of rice, but it's carried out inefficiently. So we need to add a lot of fertilizers to get our yields high. Unlike the system, SRI uses abundant supplies of naturally occurring nutrients obtained by microorganisms, feeding them to the roots of the plants because there are copious amounts of natural nutrients available. We would therefore only need to add smaller increments of fertilizers, be it organic or inorganic, to enable our rice yields to be high, yet our nitrous oxide emissions to be low. United Nations scientists have been telling rice farmers to drain their fields to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. But the farmers are afraid that this will reduce their harvest.